Good morning again, and welcome to everyone this morning, especially those that have just joined us on Facebook. We're glad to have you with us today. And as Will was mentioning, it's good to see a good number here with us live in the auditorium. We always uh, look forward to that every every Lord's Day, and it's just good to see everybody that's being able to get back in with us and get back into uh, being together in worship of God. If you take your Bibles this morning, we're going to begin our uh, service with a reading from uh, Psalm 73. Psalm 73, I'm going to read the first nine verses and then drop over and read the last uh, four, I believe. Yes. Psalm 73. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant, as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fairness, fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. They speak from on high. They have set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue parades the earth. Now I want to skip over uh, to the last four and see the conclusion that Asaph comes to. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of my God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have this morning to gather at this place and to center our thoughts on you and to remember the sacrifice made by your Son on our behalf. We pray at this time that we'll remove the thoughts of the world and realize that you are our creator, that you are all-powerful, that you are all-knowing. Realize our position that it's your authority to guide us and our responsibility to be obedient to you. We're thankful for Christ and the sacrifice that he made for us. And This morning as we remember that sacrifice, we pray that we'll take those emblems and remember his death. We're thankful for your love for us and we pray that we'll always be obedient to you and pattern our lives in a way that
pleases you and we realize we fail often and we pray that you'll forgive us in our failures and we ask at this time that you'll be with those of our number who have health issues to deal with with Ernestine Estrada and also pray that you'll be with Linda Sneed as she recovers from her surgery that soon her pain will be removed and she can return to a more normal activity. We're thankful for our health and we're thankful for all the blessings that you bestow upon us and for all the promises you've made to us if we remain faithful. We pray that we'll also consider our spiritual health and to reach out and help others in that struggle through this life. Be with us now as we worship you that it will be pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. First song this morning will be 567. 567. Um, restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, named in my soul. Stir my desires to work in your goal. Light in my heart, dear God, your real growth gold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord, it needs renewed. My God is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul.
On the front of our table here, it reads, This do in remembrance of me. Sometimes I think if we, sometimes I think we forget that a little bit when we're about to partake of the Lord's Supper. The reason, the purpose of our doing it, and the reason that we do it every week. I think back to the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt and how quickly they seemed to forget the things that God had done for them. And so for us, the idea of being able to have forgiveness of our sins, it, it's, it's hard for me to even comprehend that God made this arrangement for us. And this is what we're about to partake of this morning is the Lord's Supper so that we can remember his body, the blood that he shed, the death that he died for our sins. Will you bow with me, please? Oh, Lord God, we, we humbly come before you as we prepare to partake of this Lord's Supper. We do remember, Father, the events that Jesus had to undergo, the sacrifice that he made on our behalf, the humiliation, the shame, the actual physical suffering that he went through to die and shed his blood so that we might have the possibility of forgiveness of our sins. At this time, Father, as we're about to partake of the bread which represents that body, we do think back to the moments before he was actually hung on the cross and during the time he was on the cross. And we do remember the willingness that he had to undergo those things on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, for this bread and what it represents. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to gather around your table. We ask you, Lord, that you help clear our minds and help us focus on why we're here and why we're doing what we're doing. As we partake of this emblem, which represents the blood that you shed on that cross, we pray that we do so in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
<coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to ponder the many, many blessings that all come from your hand. And Father, as we reflect on those blessings, may we give back with a cheerful heart so others can enjoy what we have due to the ongoing work of this church here and around the world. Forgive us of our sins in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning again. As I said earlier, it's sure nice to look out and see our numbers growing each, each week. Before we get into the lesson, I wanted to say something about this evening. I'm glad that we're going back and are, have gone back to having an evening service at 6. And uh, it was good to have the good number that we did last week. Of course, the second Sunday of the month, we began with uh, singing. And that was good. Well, you know, anytime we have opportunity to come together, it's great if a part of that coming together is, is having the, the opportunity and the blessing of singing praises to God. That's, that's great, too. But uh, tonight we're going to go back to our, you know, our regular evening service uh, with the exception of the second Sunday of each month. What I want to do in the lesson tonight is, is begin looking at some lessons from the life of King David in the Old Testament. And I'll mention some of this tonight, but David was called a man after my own heart. That tells me that there was something about David, something about his life and his character and his practices in his life that was right. Now David wasn't perfect. You know that from your studies before of the life of David. But I think there are things we can learn from David his life. There are examples there for us that we can develop a heart that God would say that that's a man or that's a woman after my own heart. So we'll begin that study tonight in 1 Samuel chapter 16 when we're first introduced to David as a very young man, a, a, probably we would call him a boy, and uh, he's selected by God be the next king of Israel. 
But we'll look forward to that this evening. Now, this morning, we've been looking the last several weeks at the book of Habakkuk and striving to draw some lessons from uh, Habakkuk's perplexity, Habakkuk's situation, as he sought to reconcile in his mind and to understand in his thinking what was going on in his time, why things were looking so bleak and why things were looking so down. God's people were not living the way they ought to live and nothing was being done about it. And then he questions God, why? How long, Lord, is this going to go on? And the Lord answered him and said, well, you just wait a minute. Yeah, I'm doing something that you don't know about. But in, you know, in your lifetime, that's going to be taken care of. And, I, and I'm going to send the Babylonians to take care of Israel and to, to judge this, uh, well, it would be the southern kingdom of Judah at that time. And, and, and Habakkuk, his faith has been shaken by that. His hope was wavering. That's not what he wanted to hear. I mean, he's, he basically is saying, the Babylonians, wait a minute. You, you do know how evil and cruel and arrogant, how, how bad those... And he argues with God, as it were. He, he, he's realizing that, that Judah's fall to Babylon, it's just something that came as a hard blow to him. I wonder if he thought about the terrible curses that God said back in Deuteronomy chapter 28 when the, the, old, the younger generation, now older, that's going to be allowed to go into the promised land, God reminded them, if you don't stay faithful to me, here's what's going to happen. And now those terrible curses of Deuteronomy 28 are about to become a reality. The Babylonians are coming. And they're going to take Judah off into captivity. Among the curses, by the way, that God spoke about back in Deuteronomy chapter 28 was the, was the prophecy that there would be a siege of the cities. And during that siege, they would eat their own children. The siege would be that bad, that terrible. And so Habakkuk has presented to God the fact that, that an argument that he couldn't allow Babylon to do that. They're evil, they're arrogant, they're treacherous. And he argued with God that, God, you're too pure to let such a depraved nation come against your people. And he concluded his argument at the end of verse seven, in the end of chapter one in verse 17, and he affirmed that Jehovah would not allow such cruelty to continue. And having concluded his argument now, Habakkuk waits for God to answer. Now that's where we are as we begin chapter two. The prophet said, is, and we're going to read the first three verses as we go through each of the three points this morning. But he says in verse 1, I'm going to climb up on my guard post, my rampart. Now, the King James Version says watchtower. I'm going to climb up and I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch and I'm going to see what God's going to say and wait for God's answer. Now, this is just probably not literal. It's probably a figurative way of, of uh, Habakkuk saying, I'm waiting, God. I'm listening. I'm looking for your answer. Like a, a guard would go up on this, this guard tower, watchtower, and he would watch out on the horizon for the enemy coming over the horizon, coming against the city. And, and Habakkuk says, I'm doing that in a figurative way. This elevated position so that I can see out a, a, a little bit further. Habakkuk was waiting for God's explanation so that he could gain a new perspective on what it was about to happen to Judah and in Judah. So in verses 1, 2, and 3 here in chapter 2, I've entitled the lesson, 
gaining perspective on life's stresses. You ever feel stressed? Maybe some are, some are stressed right now. Different things, different reasons, depending on what's going on in our individual lives, depending on how we see what our perspective is of that, what our perspective is of what's going on in our nation. As far as COVID-19, as far as politics, as far as economy, everything. What, you know, there's all kinds of stresses that we see in our lives every day. And, and Habakkuk here in these verses provides us with a, with a great lesson. Because we too are often caught in, in the midst of life's stresses, life's storms, daily trials that, that toss us back and forth like, a, like a, a, a ship on the ocean, threatening to destroy us. We need an anchor, a sure anchor that, that will bring safety. We need a shelter that, that will offer to us and, and, and bring us security. Our text this morning highlights three specific ways that, that we can have problems and not be destroyed. Verse 1, Habakkuk demonstrated an unwavering faith in God. Verse 1 says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Life did not seem fair. Right, equitable to Habakkuk. But basically he is telling us that I am not going to give up on God. I'm going to stay there. I'm going to stay with Him. I, I wonder if, if Habakkuk really may have asked himself a question that, that sometimes we may think about and ask ourselves. Does it really pay to follow God. Others have questioned the appropriateness of following God's will. At the beginning of our service this morning, I read from Psalm 73, and I deliberately chose that psalm because that is the, the author there, Asaph, is struggling with this same situ circumstance, not the same situation, but the same questions about uh, is it good to follow God? Should I continue? Does it, is it for my benefit that I follow God's will? He's facing a similar struggle. And he wrote those verses there, particularly those last four that we read in Psalm 73. And he talked about the, the fact that he was going to trust God. Habakkuk and Asaph faced, both faced great problems and great perplexities in their lives, but, but neither one of them gave up on their faith. They both went to God to regain a proper perspective. Habakkuk needed to remember that God is in control. Look to him like everything was out of control. Look to him like if the Babylonians are coming, which they'd already conquered most of the world, of the known world of that day, they're coming against us and against God's people, Judah, then well, forget it. Things are over with. What good is there in doing what God wants us to do, what God uh, expects us to do to follow Him? You know, we, we're like Habakkuk sometimes. We want God to act 
And we want Him to act according to our will, our character, what we want, not according to His will. Now we, we need to understand that God is always, underline that word, always the same. Paul would write that, 2 Timothy 2 and verse, thir verse 13. Since God remains the same, and since His purposes cannot be disrupted, then we must remain committed to Him and to His will. Even when life makes no sense. Even when we don't understand what's going on. Only when we stay committed to God can we gain the victory over our problems. Committed to God. Wholehearted concentration to God. Consecration to God brings wholehearted confidence in God and His power. In his ability. Habakkuk was confident that God would answer him. And so he says, I'm going to get up on my watchtower, my guard post, and I'm going to look out and I'm going to be on the watch for what God has to say. Listening, waiting is crucial. Waiting for God is, is crucial when Christians are about to be overwhelmed by stress. That's when we're the most vulnerable. Once we take a problem to God, and that's what Habakkuk has done. He's taken his problem to God and he's prayed to God about it. He's, he's talked to God about it. And we need to do the same. But once we do that, we need to follow Habakkuk's example. He said there, and I will keep watch to see what He will speak to me. Once we give the problem to God, then we need to cease fretting about it. Most of us, however, have a lot of trouble with that. Most of us Fail at this point. We, when we're faced with a problem in our lives, we go to God and we, and we pray about it and we confess that we're, we're helpless, that it's beyond our ability to deal with and to remedy. And we ask God, we turn it over to Him and we ask Him to take care of it. But then we get up from our prayer and begin worrying about it all over again. I don't need a show of hands, but I promise that most, if not all of us, have been there. Habakkuk didn't understand God's justice, but he did not give up on God. He took the matter to God, and he left it there. This is the only way that we can ever find peace when we are faced with life's problems. God assured Habakkuk, He assures us that, we, that there is a, a, a blessed peace which Paul would say passes all comprehension only when we refuse to be anxious about taking uh, all things to God in prayer. Turning it over to Him. No matter what's burdening you, no matter what's perplexing you, never allow it to overwhelm you. Once you've done all that you can, Turn it over to God and watch, wait for His reply. 
Secondly, Habakkuk was told to write down what he had heard. Verse 2, Habakkuk says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. God's response was to be publicized. God's response was to be read by by everyone. Habakkuk was to tell everyone he knew about this. And I get the idea that he says, inscribe it so that the one who reads it may run. I, I, I picture it in big letters so that the person who's running by and sees it can, can read it as they keep running. Not that it's going to scare people and they're going to run away from it. But that it's plain, it's, it's bold. God's response was to be publicized and read by many. The message could be simple and it would encourage others as they struggled with, with, the, with the frustrations of life. You know, folks, God's Word is still the only answer to life's stresses. Habakkuk rejected human with wisdom because he knew it could not give him an explanation of what was going on. He wanted to know what God had to say. He wanted to know God's instructions and God's direction. And God's Word today even continues to offer answers to everyone who will seek His divine counsel. Those who who read the Bible and lean upon its teachings will find great peace, as we were just discussing from Philippians 4. Also Psalm 119, verse 165, David there in essence says the same thing. God's Word is plain. God's Word can be read and understood. Anyone can learn from from God's answer. And you and I must proclaim God's wonderful message today. In our day, millions of people, people that we know, people that we see and we talk to every day are struggling because they do not understand what's going on. And they need to hear a message from God. And we need to publish that message. We need to to make it plain so that the one who runs can read it. We need to show the world that the answer to life's problems is found only in obedience to God's commands, to God's teachings. God's message to... Christians, but really to anyone facing the stresses of life is is simple. God says to us through His Word, trust and believe in my ability. And at the proper time, deliverance will come. God may seem slow. God may seem like He's not going to answer, but His answer will come. You and I may not be able to see to explain what's going on at the present. We may not fully grasp the situation, but we know, we know that God is in control of the present and the future just like He's been in control of the past. Life may appear from our perspective to be nonsense now. But in the future, perfect sense. 
You see, your whole perspective on life's injustices will change when you allow injustices to be corrected by God on His schedule. Think about Israel. The people of Israel in Egypt prayed for deliverance from slavery. They prayed for that deliverance for over 400 years. No doubt some wanted deliverance immediately. I mean, yesterday would have been soon enough, God, for you to have brought us out of this this bondage. But God worked in that situation as He works in all situations on His own schedule. Oh, God seemed to allow wickedness to prosper and destruction and violence to parade through the streets. A day of reckoning will come. Paul would write about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6, 7, and 8. That the day of the Lord will come. And so getting back to Habakkuk, Habakkuk resolved that he would continue at his post even though he was surrounded by problems. Let's read 3 to get get the whole thought here of what he said in these three verses. In verse 3 he says, For the vision, this is still God speaking to Habakkuk, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it will certainly come, it will not Delay. Folks, you and I today, as Christians, need to have the same resolve. Habakkuk, in essence, says in these verses, I'm going to stand. I'm going to keep watch. And I'm going to be faithful. That's the, that's the real message of these verses. Even though we are pounded by problems, we must continue in that same resolve as Habakkuk did. Our hope may be shaken and doubts may arise in our minds, but we must remain diligent followers of God. Paul wrote to the Christians at Corinth and he charged them at the end of chapter 15 and verse 58. He charged them to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Whatever circumstances are, whatever it looks like as we look out from From our perspective, Paul said, you do this. You remain steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Even when life's stresses tempt you to give up and tempt you to compromise your diligence. See, when we allow our perspectives, our perplexities to keep us from working in the Lord's church, our problems will increase. Our fellowship connections will lessen. Our trust in God will weaken. However, if we maintain our diligence and we maintain working for God, that activity itself will lighten the burden of life stresses. And that's true in 
everyone's life. Every one of us. That's true of us. There are times when any one of us feel like throwing in the towel, giving up, walking away from, staying away from the assembly of the saints. We're tired. We're distressed. And we become tempted to withdraw and, and focus on our problems. This is so hard and so tough that I've got to, I've got to concentrate all my efforts and all my energy on it and, and bring myself through this. As soon as we do that, our problems are compounded. Compounded. Go to the assemblies of the Lord's people. When we go to the, the gathering of the church, even if we can't reach the point where we have to force ourselves to do that, fellowship, the activity, all comes together to lighten our burdens. And being in the assembly with brothers and sisters in Christ, we are able to face life with renewed strength. Thinking about the book of Hebrews. The Hebrew Christians that the book was written to. This was their struggle. They were, were struggling with life. They were having this, this same concern and these same perplexities that we're seeing in Habakkuk that, that we often experience in our lives. And evidently many of them were, were just given up and stopping assembling with the saints. And so the writer gives a strong command not to forsake the assembly. Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 26. Because that's where we find the strength. That's one of the places besides God's Word that we find the strength to face the perplexities of life, the difficulties of life. See, when we are burdened, we need to maintain diligence in our duties to God. Failure to be active assures further discouragement. When we're burdened with stress, we must not quit. We should regain the proper perspective like Habakkuk is doing here as we're reading these, these verses. Regain the proper perspective by being active in the service of God. Whatever it is that we can do in the kingdom to serve and do His will. When life's pressures bring a, a heavy burden into our lives, it's easy to think that all is lost. Just give up. Quit. However, when we turn it over to God in prayer, when we go to His Word in seeking His guidance and, and, and direction. And we wait for heaven's response. God will help us to overcome life's stresses. But that wait, that's what gets most of us. We want it Yesterday would have been not too soon. 
In these three verses of the opening, uh, opening chapter 2 here in Habakkuk, Habakkuk's prophecy marks a, a turning point in what we're reading here. Here is an here is a underlying and significant factor. The hope that Habakkuk received in the vision that he has that he writes about here in, in his little book, it's the same hope which you and I can have as children of God today, as Christians today. That same hope that we can maintain. History as we know it is in God's hands. It is His story that we are playing out in our lives and He is in control. Well, he has given us the wonderful and and, and magnificent ability to think for ourselves, to, to rationalize and to choose whether we're going to follow Him and trust Him, whatever situations are going on in our lives, or whether we're going to turn our backs on Him and say, no, thank you. I can handle this myself. I'm going to do it my way. The question this morning What's your choice? Are you going to trust Him? Are you going to turn it all over to Him? Well, there are things for us to do, yes. We take action and we do what we can, yes. That's, that, that's what God says for us to do. But we've also got to realize that He holds the world in His hands. He's still in charge. He's still in control. The end. What wonderful, wonderful blessings await. Choosing God begins with choosing to obey Him, with being buried with Christ in baptism, surrendering my life and saying, I'm not me anymore, I'm turning myself, and Christ is going to now live in me because He died for my sins and I'm going to surrender to His will. If you've not done that, opportunity is always available as long as time continues. But we have no guarantee of time, do we? Or maybe you've done that and and things have gotten difficult and you've decided that, that God's not going to take any action, so I'm going to... Basically, I'm going to give up on God. I hope that's not your case. If it is, listen to Habakkuk. Remember God. Remember He's in control. Climb up on your watchtower and wait, watching for His answer. Because He will answer. He will answer. There's something that we can do to help you this morning and you're waiting on the Lord. Then we urge you to make that known by coming as we stand.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this Lord's Day, the freedom to assemble here and hear from your inspired word. The freedom to sing these songs of praise, which you truly deserve and are worthy of. Father, our prayers that everything we've done this morning has been according to your will and pleasing in your sight. Be with each of us as we begin a new work week that we can go out and show that you are living within us through our actions and our words. Be with each of us that we may strive to live by the example that Jesus led here in this world. That everything we do is putting you first. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.